today. Right. The behavior is based on a value. And the value is honesty. I tell new presidents in the Harvard program, if you lie to people, they will never trust you. One of the points my students said was about trust, right? And so the behavior that shows people, whether it's on something professional or personal, that you care and that you're being honest about it. You're saying it from a good space. You, you're saying it because you believe it and you care about the person. That leads to the trust. Leaders need to act in such a way that people truly trust them. That to know whether it's good news or bad, it will be the truth. It's seeking the truth that makes a difference in the long run. So um, you recently released this book, yes. The Empowered University. So, um, you know, Dr. Grabowski obviously is internationally known for his leadership in higher education. But higher education, in many ways, is a giant bureaucracy. Yes. And, and uh, I've always felt like um, the politics on a college campus are unrivaled in any other, <laughs> in, in any other organization. So um, I looked up um, something that you, that you mentioned in here. Um, and in fact, it's, you're quoting someone else in the geography of bliss. Oh, yes, yes. Where we are is vital to who we are. Yes. By where I'm speaking not only of our physical environment, but also of our cultural environment. Yes. Culture is the sea we swim in, so pervasive so all-consuming that we fail to notice its existence until we step out of it. Yep. It matters more than we think. Yeah. You changed the culture at UMBC as an organization. And so um, considering the, the team you have in, in front of you are the leaders of yes. Montgomery County, yes. um, how important is the culture of an organization yeah. and how does one impact or change that culture? Sure, a sure. very famous business guy said, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch or breakfast. Or the idea is the culture is the essence of who we are. By the way, the book is written, I, I'm a co-author, I'm the lead author, but the co-authors are, are um, um, the provost, Philip Rouse, and a Montgomery County resident, Peter Henderson, uh, who uh, really had moved to us from the National Academy of Sciences and, and is an expert in this work. And what I would say is this, and the, the, the subtitle of the book is Shared Leadership, Culture Change, and Success, Academic Success. The point, shared leadership. The first sentence in the book says, it's not about me, it's about us. Leaders understand, you don't make it about yourself. It's got to be about other people. Very important, right? And it's empowering other people. And part of our culture was, quite frankly, we were still young. When I went there, we were only 20 years old. We were founded in 1966. Now the new president who came to us from being dean at Duke, Dr. Valerie Ashby, is, um, uh, was born in 1966. It's a great story, it really is. I finished high school in 1966, you know. But the fact is, so we were only 20 years old, so we were still evolving. And you can imagine, we came out of College Park. People came from College Park, then we started hiring from all over the world. But we needed to build our own identity. You'll notice we are a very nerdy school. We're very proud about that. We're very nerdy. We really are. You see a member of the chess team, you bow your head. You see somebody who's good in math, yeah, that's it, right? I mean, it's a place where, by the way, I've never seen an American audience with that many people stand for math. I'm very serious. I mean, you all are just too privileged. It's amazing. I love it. But the key is, it was about being willing, as Mark said, to, be, to sit down and have the tough conversations. Because we were bragging on the few kids who were making it, going to med school or whatever, but the average student was not doing well of any race. They thought it was a problem of minority students, but we looked at the data. No, the average kid, in fact, what I say in my TED talk is two-thirds of students who go off to college of all races to major in science or pre-med don't make it. Two-thirds. That's why only 5% of the degrees are in natural sciences and engineering. We still need them in arts and humanities, but the point is we needed to look in the culture at ourselves. Because we call, NSF calls first two years of math and science engineering in colleges and universities weed out courses. So here's what, one of the, just one action. I remember, all of you remember this, when you were in college as a freshman, the dean or the president would say, look at the student to your left, look at the student to your right, and then they would tell, one of you will not be here. All right? And so it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. The fact is, in America, we say the graduation rate after 60 years is 60%, but for community colleges, we've got a challenge, and for four-year colleges. So you put it all together, you're talking about maybe 30-some percent of people graduating 
um, from a two or four year college within the first six years. Now, suppose I told you in hospitals that two thirds won't make it. <laughs> if you go into the hospital, you got a one third chance of making it. I mean, think about it, that you're gonna die if you didn't make it, right? And that's the challenge we face in terms of urgency. We've gotta help millions of Americans start it at a two or four year institution and unfortunately never got a degree or a diploma or a certificate. That's our challenge. And that was what we found, bringing the urgency to it, not just resting on the laurels. You all, yeah, I looked at the data last night. Um, you are the, not just the richest large county, um, Howard County has, I mean, you're the only county in the state that has over a million people. You're the only one. And then Prince George's has 900,000, and then the rest, it goes down to 400,000. You know, same thing, you got, and the, the whole, let me ask you one question, Brett, about culture in our, in our country. What percent of Americans do you think, when I went to jail in the mid-60s, had graduated from four-year college? What do you think? In the mid-60s? I heard 12%, somebody else? Five, 10, anybody else? It was 20, okay. How many of you admit you don't know? Tell the truth. So you wanna know this, because you are all, you're not just educated people, you are educators. You're teaching every day in one way or the other. Only 10% of Americans had graduated from college in 1965. And when you break it down, it's broken down by race. At that time, all are black and white. Because how many of you remember color, black and white TV? <laughs> oh, you look good. You do, because <laughs> the students say, what do you mean? TV's always been in color. No, no. We got the first color TV on our block. I thought it meant they were going to be colored people on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, true story. But here's the point. Only 2%, 2 to 3% of blacks, only 11% of whites. So in the mid-60s, 90% of Americans had never seen anybody in their family go to college and graduate. Did you get that? Not, now, talk about changing the culture. After the Higher Education Act, the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, today we're up to what percent of Americans have a four-year degree? What do you think? Come on, don't be risk adverse. Leaders take risk. What I say, what I hear? I heard 65, I heard 25. Fair to say, how many don't know? Raise your hands, right? Fact is, so you can always know, only about 35% of Americans have seen somebody in their family graduate from college. Four-year college, okay? All right. And two-year colleges are more important than ever. 40-some percent of all Americans start in two-year colleges. Give the community colleges and Montgomery College a round of applause. They do a good job. They really do. They really do. So here's the point, all right? You break it down for me. What percent of, what's, what's the, what is the highest achieving group in America? Racially, ethnically? Somebody always tells me black women, but I love it. It's just as wrong as it can be, but I love that confidence. I love it. I love it. I love it. You keep saying it. You go, girl. Wait a minute. I love it. I love that's, that's it. Our, that's our director of technology and enterprise business solutions. I love it. Right I love there. it. You keep right. saying it because you know what? You're going to plant that seed and it's going to get there, right? But it's, it's, it's Asian. You all know that. Nobody wants to say it, but of course it is. It's 55% of Asian Americans from different backgrounds have literally had somebody graduate from college and graduate from college, okay? But it's not every Asian group. We know that Pacific Islanders and some others have some challenges, but particularly when you, and, and let me ask one other question. This is an honest question now. How many of you believe that in the world there are many more brilliant Indian and Chinese children than American children? There are many more brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children. People cringe when I say that. They go, oh God, he didn't say that. Now you might be thinking it, but you're not saying it. Well, it is not a politically incorrect question. That is a mathematical question. There are 1.3 billion Chinese in the world, 1.2 billion Indians in the world. You put those two together, you have 2.5 billion people. What is 10% of 2.5 billion? Don't you, let me leave this in Montgomery County to no basic math. <laughs> what's 10% what's of 2.5 billion? 250. 250 million, right? 250 million, and we only have 320 million Americans. So there are that many geniuses from those two countries as we have citizens. You get my point? So it, it's understandable. So why am I telling you all changing the culture means rethinking who we are, wh who brings what strengths, and most important, how to be honest about these issues. That's the point. Okay. So um, you, you brought up the, the, um, the line about at the opening day of college, the dean saying, you know, look to your right, look to your left. Mm -hmm. What is it you say at UMBC that is different? Yeah, yeah, and I want you to imagine your students at UMBC, students, you got this. Look at the student to your left, everybody. Look at the person to your left, look at the person to your right, 
Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate, and if you don't, we fail, and we don't plan to fail. Big round of applause. We don't plan to fail. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Self and whether it is about leadership uh, in a county with different services and helping in so many different ways, or it's about working with students, whether it's in law enforcement or in education or in healthcare or in a county or whatever, it is truly, leadership is about believing in what you do. Understanding why what you do matters. Finding strategies to give you inspiration. I'll never forget when one of the students was saying, well, how do you get when you get discouraged, right? What do you do? We all get discouraged. We all are dealing with mental health issues. With all the great stuff about Montgomery County, you are human beings. So from family to children to, to parents to illness, all these are challenges. And I always say we should look first to our own stories. How did we get here? Who washed somebody else's bathroom so you could be here? Because if I go back generations enough for Americans, nobody. How many of you are first generation college? Raise your hand. Very privileged group. Very privileged group. Only about 30. How many are second generation college? How many are third generation college? Wonderful. As I say, you are among the most privileged. How many are five generation college? We see three or four hands. You get my point? So everybody was doing menial labor at some point. You, you see what I'm saying? And, and, and yet those people did that work so you could sit here today. And as my grandmother said to one of her grandchildren years ago, how dare you not do your best when I'm breaking my back so you can go and finish high school. You see? So when we are feeling a little discouraged, remember, you go back a generation or two, and they had it so much harder from any race. They really did. It's that inspiration from stories that can make the difference. And finally, it's the building community among people. You need people you can bounce things off. You need to know people who will tell you the truth. You need people, if they see you, if you look like you're having a health problem, who will care about you enough to say, are you working most closely with your doctor? You know when, when new presidents, I work with 75 new presidents in the Harvard program every year from around the world, from University of Ghana to universities in Ireland and uh, to the institutions here, and they, they said, what's the most important thing to remember as a leader for him? And I said, the number one thing is to take care of yourself your health. It's hard to be your best if you're not healthy. And that's why any effort, you see this in the most enlightened companies, universities around, working to talk about health, to say we all, I mean, I do take blood pressure medicine. I'm always very important. I'm always working on my health. Always, always. And the big line for me, everybody knows it is, I said since I was a kid, there's a fat frame on the inside trying to get out. Uh huh. I've got to slap him back in when he comes up. <laughs> get back in there. <laughs> Anybody? How many of you have had weight issues in your life? Raise your hands. You see what I mean? I mean, it's for a whole lot of people. Now, for, we Southerners say about people who are very thin, we say the food goes to their feet, right? You know? But for most people, you know where it shows up, right? From your face and everything. But what is my point? And we know that, I'm not just talking vanity, we know that weight is a major issue in health for your pressure and other kinds of things. And as you get older, you begin to realize that. It's that sincerity of caring and a culture that says we care about each other that can make the difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm worried about my own weight. <laughs> Like, uh oh. You're a young uh, man, you uh, still have time. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's interesting we're talking about health because I'm looking right at Karen Bass, who's the, who's the manager responsible for our health care program oh. and all the different things that we have available I saw with the Live Well program. And, Good. But um, she has the next question oh. that I'm going to ask. Her. Okay. Um, what do you think is the key to being innovative? in a highly bureaucratic organization? Because some people here might think we are a bureaucratic organization. So I don't, there might be a handful of you who think Montgomery County government is bureaucratic, but just for those people who do, what is your advice for yeah, how to be all, innovative? Anytime you have people together, the only way you get something done is to have some rules and regulations. We know that, we really do. You know, I often think about the question, you know, you think about car accidents, just think about it if, 2% of people didn't follow the rules. Just 2%. We'd have accidents all over the place. So, I mean, we have to start there. We've got to have regulations. But I would say this. It's about encouraging people to have curiosity and to speak their truth. It's about 
being willing to be uncomfortable. Everybody knows I studied French. When I started four years ago, my students said, don't you think you're kind of old? And that was all I needed. I said, bring it on, bring it on. So yeah. je parle français. Qui parle français ici? Qui parle français? Uh, uh, nous parlons le français ensemble. Uh, so je parle français avec mes étudiants tous les jours. Tous les jours. I'm, every day I'm studying French. All right, many of my students on campus constantly. And my professor had told originally that Normandy, il est normal, il est très difficile. Uh, but I'm learning every day. What is the point? You never stop learning. If you want innovation, you must assume that we've got so much more to know. I want you to look up the word neoteny, N-E-O-T-E-N-Y. It's in the book Geeks and Geezers, Harvard Business. Neoteny is a science term, but it's used, my scientist knows that, but it's used there to mean being forever young, being forever young. We, as we get older, if we're not careful, we become cynical. Been there, done that, right? Young people come in and just knock it about, just knock it out of the way, right? We want to encourage that neoteny. We want all of us, and that means laughing more. If I go to a place and nobody laughs, I say they're not healthy. If they take themselves that seriously, Walter Sondheim died at 99, but he said, Freeman, live life seriously, but don't take it seriously. It means don't take yourself so seriously. So if we can encourage people to speak up and to ask the hard questions and to speak their truth and to allow for disagreements. You know, we teach kids how to win in college. When I'm working with Harvard, I mean, pres presidents up at Harvard, I'm saying, you know, everybody complains about Congress, but they, all of them came out of our colleges. Think about it. What is it we didn't do? And it has to do with how do we help people to be willing to disagree with some civility and to listen to the other point of view. No side has all the right answers. No side, okay? We can all learn. So it's taking a changing mindset, it's important, okay? So I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, uh, what tips do you have to motivate um, employees, and the same thing for students, sure. in a virtual environment? Yes, yeah, I, I would say, first of all, Emphasize good habits and practices. You heard Mark talk about intermittent fasting, doing different kinds of things to work on your weight, for example. But also, I mean, Jackie and I, we've now been married. I got married right out of college, and I finished my math major at 18 and got married at 19. I've been married 52 years. Give my wife a round of applause for that. And here's the point. We are always trying new things. We want the relationship fresh and romantic. Nobody thinks about it. Yeah, you can be romantic at any age. It means being sensitive to the other person. How often do you call somebody you care about to say, I care about you? Did you know that, right? But we do Tai Chi together. We do acupuncture together, right? We exercise. She's doing a Pilates. I got to get my steps in. Oh, we study the French. I mean, doing new things and, and looking into the eyes of people, even when it's virtual looking into their eyes, even when it's very, sometimes people can be more intimate virtually than they are in public because we take them for granted and that makes the difference, all right? Being intentional about building relationships with your colleagues. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who will, who will uh, really depress you and those who will inspire you. Some of y'all are depressing already, I can tell it. That's a joke, folks, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But every day, everybody makes that decision. Am I gonna uplift people? or am I gonna bring them down, all right? That's a decision every day each person makes. Um, speaking about winning, yes. uh, a, a uh, proud alum in the audience wanted to know uh, how far UMBC is gonna go in the NCAA tournament this year. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, I know for a fact they will be so impressive. We're, regardless of what happens, I always say this, when our teams leave, you know they have a sense of self. I was saying, so let me give you one inspiring athletic fact. The fact is, I just got a note from a student and from my coach of the men's soccer team, and they didn't make it to that final area, but seven of them had a 4.0 this year. Give the men's soccer team a round of applause. I want, them to, I want them to be competitive, but I really want them to learn. You give, give me a round of applause for learning being more important than anything else. So, um, uh -huh. Uh, what people may not know, the, the UMBC team is the Retrievers. Yes. 
So, but the name of the retriever mascot yep. is? True Grit, and there is the word. That for, even for our students, we need to move away so much from the word smart, because as some of the experts will say, you don't want some kids to feel like they're the super smart ones. What about everybody else, right? The word is grit. Angela Duthworth says it. We've been saying it for years. We call ourselves the house of grit. What really makes a difference, students? How hard you work, how passionate you are, how you bring that intensity to it, right? How you never, never, never give up. I mean, I see the faces. Some people are ready to give an answer to that problem. They are so ready. I love it. I love that hunger. You want to be hungry. And there's the challenge to Montgomery County. You must remain hungry, hungry for your county to be better. And not, it's not good enough to be the best in Maryland or the best in this country. You want to strive to help our children and their families to live a good life, more than about material things, but about a good life, the values they hold, the dreams they hold. I want to thank you for being so special to my campus, to the University System of Maryland. You help make all of us better, and we are grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Freeman. Um, <laughs>